Um, hello, everyone. My name is Molly. I am um, with Underdog Behavior and Consulting, and I've been um, doing some private training for POSCO for a little while now. And we're just going to talk today about some common topics for um, fostering, especially new fosters, um, some things that might come up for you guys. So we're going to do a few topics that um, kind of uh, we pulled, Marie pulled everybody, and um, these seem to be kind of um, universal and then we're going to open it up for questions for the last 20 minutes or so. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how to properly introduce your foster dog to your dogs, to your cats, to your kids, um, and to strangers, new people coming into the house. So um, first of all, I strongly encourage you guys when you have dogs already in the home and you are seeking another foster dog and POSCO is awesome about this, so, you know, you'll be able to talk to them and find out, you know, definitely you want a social dog. Um, and, you know, a lot of dogs are just like people, so, you know, they're not, it, there's no guarantee that every dog is going to get along with every other dog. I mean, it's just kind of asinine for us to expect that. Um, so a lot of times we can think our dogs are more pro-social than they are because they live with another dog or they get along with the neighbor's dogs or, you know, your mom's dogs who come over regularly or something like that. Um, so I strongly encourage you to just give it some thought as far as, um, you know, what kind of dog you, when, when you raise your hand and say, yes, I wanna take this dog into my home, um, make sure that you advocate for your personal dogs and the kind of dog that they're gonna get along with or you know, that you think they're gonna get along with um, based on what they have in the past. So kind of think back and think, all right, well, you know, he's, he, she, he's done really well with, um, with smaller females, but that one time we ran into that big bulldog, uh, that male bulldog, he didn't do well with that, you know, that kind of thing. So brainstorm and kind of make a little list and think, um, what's the best way to set this interaction up for success? And that can, can kind of take some of the work off of the back end um, of, you know, trying to match up dogs and, and spending time doing that. And also, Keep in mind too that when you do um, dog intros and they don't go well, um, that is really stressful for your personal dogs. Um, so there is some wear and tear on their what we call padding um, when that happens. So if you have an interaction that does not go well with your dogs, I encourage you um, to kind of think of it like a numbers game and make sure that they have three to five really positive interactions with dogs that they that you know they do well with after that interaction happens. Um, it's just like us. If you if you know, if, if you met five people in a row and all of them tried to punch you in the face, um, you might start punching people in the face right away, right? So <laughs> you want to have, you want to make sure for your dogs that you have lots of pro-social experiences in there. Um, so that being said, if you guys are able to, you know, get a dog out of the, uh, off the roster that, um, you know, has a known pro-social history, that's going to be the best thing for you to do for your dogs and to set everything up for success. Um, sometimes, you know, the, the, the dog tests are in the shelter where the dogs come to the shelter as a stray and um, you know the, the shelter uh, man, the shelter workers don't know or anything, you know, so they try to do a dog test at the shelter. Um, a lot of times those aren't really done properly. The dogs are super stressed out. They're at like three and a half times their stress levels. And, you know, sometimes the staff isn't properly trained and so they choke up on the leashes and um, so they can Basically, what I'm getting at here is, is sometimes, through no fault of POSCOs, they won't have accurate information on how a dog is going to do. Um, and sometimes dogs do really well in dog tests in the shelter, and then you get them into a home and they start getting nice and comfortable, um, and then some issues pop up like resource guarding or bullying, stuff like that. Um, so keep that in mind too. All those things are unknowns to everyone in the universe, um, including the dogs. So. Um, you know, you just kind of you just kind of want to keep your eyes open for for anything um, anything that would indicate that this dog has not lived with dogs in the past. Your best bet always is to get a dog who's been an owner surrender, who has lived with dogs and done well, um, who has had you know three to zero incidences where there's been dog fights. You know, where that where that dog has sent another dog to the vet, and we we say that basically within like a five year span. Um, so. 
when you're doing your dog introductions, if you have a dog who you know is super pro-social and you know that your dog is super pro-social, you can be pretty relaxed about it. You always want to be cautious, of course, um, but the, the stats are on your side there. If your dog has met 100 dogs at the dog park and done absolutely awesome with all of them, um, you know, you can, you can be pretty... Um, you can be pretty relaxed about your intro, but still what you're going to do is um, you're going to want to best case scenario is to have a fenced in yard or a fenced in space so that we don't have to have any tension on any leashes. Um, and if you can do that, then what you want to do is put the unknown dog on a long line, the longest one you have, uh, 10 or so feet would be great, 10, 20 feet would be awesome, and have them drag that long line behind them. And then your dog, who you know is super social, you can just either have off leash or have on a, a drag line as well, a six foot leash that um, they drag and you do not hang on to. Um, and what you'll wanna do is you'll wanna have someone hanging on to the long line of the foster dog, um, but not putting any pressure on it. So the reason we want all that length on the line is so that it can simulate an off leash experience. Um, I'm sure you guys have all seen um, how we can make dog introductions a lot worse by choking up on the leash. I don't know about you, but if I was trying to make a new friend and I was also being asphyxiated, um, I might not be so kind to that new friend, especially if I thought that the proximity of that friend was what was causing the asphyxiation. Um, so we wanna be really cautious when we're introducing dogs on leash to make sure that we simulate the off leash scenario as much as possible by keeping that slack in the leash. And I'll tell you guys, it takes practice. Um, because our, our blood pressure spikes and we, you know, our fear of something going wrong takes over a lot of times and you, you know, your muscle memory can just be like, get the leash as short as possible so that I have the most control over this scenario. Uh, but the ironic thing about that is, is that just the action of doing that, it greatly increases the chances that you're gonna have a dog fight on your hands. Um, so have your, your foster dog on his long line and you're in the, the gated area so that your um, known pro-social, your, your companion dog um, can be off leash or have, have the leash dragging. Um, and you'll want them across the yard or just a, a little bit of distance, you know, 10 feet, something like that. You don't want your foster dog's nose to be at the door when you open the door to let your, your dog out. Um, you wanna be very mindful of tight spaces. You don't want an introduction to be in a doorway or on a deck that's really tight or something like that. You wanna make sure that there's plenty of space for each dog to feel like they can move away if that they feel like the interaction's not going well. Um, so you'll have your, you've got your foster dog on your long line. Um, you've got plenty of space between the entrance of your companion dog and the foster dog. Um, you go ahead and open the door. And if you have any concerns about how your dog is going to do, I suggest that you also put your dog on a long line um, and make sure that you kind of manage that. Um, and then, you, you know, the dogs will probably run up to each other right away. And um, the common greeting is to go nose to nose. There's usually um, quite a bit of tail wagging going on. And then um, you want to see them go right to the orifice circle. So go from nose to nose, um, right to kind of sniffing orifices, maybe a play bow, a paw raise, um, you know, some bouncy gates, that kind of stuff. That's all, it's all really good stuff. Um, also, too, you might have a situation where you're, um, your foster dog doesn't really want to interact yet with your with your your dog, depending on where they came from and what their history's been and what their day was like, um, and all that. So don't be too dismayed if there's a lot of ignoring going on. Ignoring is also much better um, than the alternative. So worst case scenario, if you do have a dog fight on your hands, um, you know hopefully you'll 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 be able to break it apart via the leashes, um, and that's kind of the reason for them. And you can call the dogs away from one another, and you know be very excited clap run um, I'm always like okay 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 come on come on come on come on come on come on, come on, come on, come on. Um, and get their attention that way have them run away from the other dog with you um, if you have a latching situation grab the dog by the hips um, right on the torso where the back legs meet the body wheel barrel their back legs up and then back up with your body uh, when a dog is in this position with his front paws on the ground he cannot uh, bite you um, so this is a good way to, to get a couple, two dogs away from each other safely. And you can hold them in that wheelbarrow position for as long as you need to for them to calm down. Um, so I'm not really sure as far as um, 
what POSCO's rules are, but I, I imagine that, you know, someone from POSCO is usually there for that interaction and can probably help take the lead on that too. Um, but that's kind of how you want to introduce your dogs together. Always in a big open space, always have control of the unknown dog in some way, shape or form, and always simulate off leash as much as you can. Um, and again, we'll have a question, uh, we'll have a, a time for questions at the end of this. So cats, um, you know, the, the thing with cats, you guys, again, if you can find a dog who has a known pro-social cat history, who has lived with cats and not killed them, um, that's going to be your best bet. Um, however, if you um, so choose to, to try out a, a dog and, and find out if they're good with cats, which is really valuable in the rescue community, um, we really need to know if an unknown dog is uh, cat savvy and cat friendly. It, it drastically increases their chances of getting adopted. Um, so there is a way that you can do it safely. And, um, you know, I, so basically check out the topography of your house. If you're in a tiny house, um, you know, with a bunch of animals, it's probably not the best situation for you. But if you have an area in which you can keep the cats and the dogs completely separate, you know, an upstairs, downstairs type situation, um, or, you know, two different wings or something like that, that kind of come into the middle of the house, um, then, you know, I, I strongly suggest that you, that you give it a whirl, especially if your cats are already dog savvy. Um, those are definitely the kind of cats that can help a transition go really well for a dog who's never really hung out with cats before. Um, so the, the, short, the short of it is, is the more time you take, the better. Um, it can be really tempting for us to push these intros because the body language looks good or because we just think it's going to be fine or whatever. Um, but a, 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 the, the proper cat intros with dogs that I did not think was going to go that well, um, some of them took two to three months before they were actually no leash on the dog, no baby gate up. Um, you know, no complete eyeballs on the whole situation with the treat bag there before everyone was relaxing and you could fall asleep on the couch while cats and dogs were in the same room together. Um, not to say that every situation is going to take that long, but there is no harm in taking a really, really long time and making sure that everyone's consenting um, to, the, to the situation, especially the cats. So you wanna start with a closed door, dog and cat sniff each other under the door, that kind of stuff. Um, you allow the dog into the cat space for a little while while the cat's not in there, allow the dog into the, or the cat into the dog space a little while while the, do while the dog's not in there, you guys got that, um, to allow for a lot of sniffing and that can um, ease some, excitement from the dog because what he's trying to do is get information mostly and that usually ends up looking pretty scary to a cat um, which can start a fight. Um, so the more information you can give the dog about the cat, letting him sniff the bed, the cat tree, all that kind of stuff, the sooner the better. Um, and then you'll move to a baby gate and then you know you'll see how that goes once the dog's nice and calm on the other side of the baby gate you'll have an on leash situation um, you know so that you have the leash in your hand you've got control of it if the dog tries to chase the cat it's a no 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 maybe into a timeout type of thing um, and so on so as long as the dog you know is, is nice and relaxed around the cat and isn't like pinging towards the cat trying to eat him, um, you know, you can use your discretion as far as how quickly you want to move forward. And you know what? The cat will tell you. So pay attention to the cat's body language. If the cat is just like laid back and, you know, is feeling good about it, then, you know, it's probably going well. Um, okay, kiddos and new people, they're kind of, they can kind of be lumped into the same thing. So when you're introducing a dog to a new person, um, and this includes yourself, um, always use very, very high fat content food. So you guys might have checked out the um, handout called High Value Treats and um, a little bit of the science behind that when um, when a dog, when any mammal, or ourselves included, um, is eating food that is high in fat content, our brain um, basically releases uh, neurotransmitters that make us feel good, right? Um, so if, if you eat a piece of steak, you feel a lot more happy than a piece of broccoli or some ice cream over, you know, a carrot or something like that. It's the same thing for our dogs. So when our dogs, when a, when a foster dog is introduced in, in getting introduced into a new home, um, and especially with new with new sizes of people, new shapes of people, new smells of people, all that kind of stuff. Um, they're trying to, their mind is trying to do pattern recognition as quickly as possible. Am I in danger? Is this a safe place? What's gonna happen to me here? Is this person a good guy? Is this person a bad guy? All that kind of stuff. Um, when you pop a piece of high fat content food into the dog's mouth um, in a certain situation or around a certain a kid or a new person or something like that, um, it kind of short circuit the brain to automatically pop it 
pop you into the good guy category or whatever came before that treat into the good guy category. Very, very rarely do we find dogs who have had bad experiences with people who have also then fed them a bunch of chicken. Um, it's just, it's just not really, you know, it just doesn't really happen that much. So we have this kind of tool with chicken, hot dogs, bacon, steak, all that kind of yummy stuff um, to convince a dog's brain really quickly that a new thing that the dog's going, is this good? Is this bad? Is this scary? I don't know. Oh, I just got a mini Xanax. I just, I just felt really, really safe and happy and good. Um, never mind the fact it was due to the food. Um, what happens is, you know, once you pair the kid with the high fat content food enough times, um, the dog will, will start to think, okay, this kid is awesome. Every time this kid walks into the room, it rains chicken. Um, so you guys can kind of see where I'm going with this. You have the dog behind a baby gate, something like that. The kid walks into the room. Um, you toss chicken to the dog. Kid walks out of the room, no more chicken. Kid walks into the room, chicken, chicken, chicken. Kid walks out of the room, no more chicken. Um, and you can kind of repeat that. And then depending on how old your kid is, um, you know, you can have them come and toss the chicken and stuff like that. And then when your dog looks nice and soft and wiggly and is doing pro-social things like trying to approach the kid or the new person, um, they're interchangeable here, um, you know, walking up to get pets and stuff like that, then you can transition to the, to the new person or the kid actually feeding the dog, asking them to sit, um, all that kind of stuff. So, okay, we're going to move on to house and crate training. Um, I'm not sure if uh, POSCO requires you guys to do crate training. Um, if you, you know, you can do house training without crate training. It actually, with this quarantine stuff, now is probably the best time to do it um, because what you really need the crate for is to make sure that there are no accidents. So um, the three big pieces of house training are making sure that the dog does not have the opportunity to rehearse the accidents in the house and that is management right so um, if I have a new foster dog in the house for the first like 48 hours the dog is either tethered to my waist or he's in a crate um, or he's in a dog proof room um, you know a bathroom or something or you know something like that if I'm, if I'm in the shower he's in the bathroom with me um, and that is just so that he does not have the opportunity to go off and rehearse um, peeing in the house or pooping in the house or something like that when you know when I can't catch him in the act so management, management, management. So make sure that the house is set up, doors are closed, you've got a plan. If the first couple of days the dog only spent stays in one room, great. You'll get your you'll get off to your house, you'll get off to a great start for your house training. Um, and then also the crate. You want a crate that's just big enough for the dog to stand up and turn around in, but not big enough for him to defecate in one corner and not have to lay down in it. Um, so if you are using a crate um, and you know you want to go through the crate training steps that are in that crate training handout that I gave you. Um, but make sure, you know, to pop the dog in the crate when you're not paying attention so that he can't sneak off into another room and eliminate. Um, now, that being said, when you do catch the dog attempting to eliminate, so you want to be kind of sleuthy, right? You want to, you want to watch to make sure they're, watch to look for sniffing or circling or anything like that. And the moment you see that, it's let's go outside. Um, and you bring the dog right out to whatever spot you want them to eliminate. And you kind of stand there for five or so minutes. Um, if they don't do anything, no big deal. You go right back inside and you watch like a hawk because you know that they have to go and they're going to try it again. They're going to try and go somewhere. Um, you see them sniffing, you see them circling, any of that, let's go outside and repeat, 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 repeat. At, at some point, the dog's going to eliminate outside um, because they have to. And at that, at that point, throw them a chicken party. Praise like crazy, chicken, hot dog, steak, everything in the world um, to help convince them that outside is a better place for them to go than inside. So dogs don't understand the concept of a roof or, you know, the four walls or shingles or any of that kind of stuff, right? They don't have any idea why outside is better than inside for, for using the bathroom for relieving themselves. Um, so we need to give them a really good reason to potty outside. Um, so every time they do, we want to make sure to throw them a party. We want them thinking, oh my gosh, I, 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 next time I have to pee, I'm going to hold it so that I can do it outside so I can get my hot dogs and my chicken and my, and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, when our dogs eliminate in the house, um, if you do not catch the dog, there is no point in late punishment. Um, rubbing the dog's nose in it and, you know, scolding the dog and, you know, rolling down, rolling the dog and stuff like that. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to make the dog afraid of you. Um, and especially afraid of you when there's urine around. Um, dogs don't have the ability to put the uh, time lapse in and 
and associate the punishment with the fact that they have urinated, what they associate is that there is urine in the room and a human is in the room, um, and and then I'm going to get I'm going to get in trouble if I'm in a room with urine in it and a human. Um, so what that does when we punish a dog for urinating in the house or defecating in the house, it teaches the dogs to be very very sneaky about when and where they go. They learn to go when your back is turned. They learn to go in another weird spare bedroom under the piano. Um, they start to really sneak off uh, because they think that elimination and human together are a really scary combination. Um, so we'll get dogs that do what we call reverse house training, which is where they hold it. Um, you know, they hold it. They don't want to do it outside either because there's a human standing there and they think, um, you know, peeing in front of the human means I'm getting my nose rubbed in it. So I'm going to hold it and hold it and hold it until we're in the house. She's cooking. I can sneak off into the bedroom and do it there in, in peace and quiet and without getting, you know, without getting capital punishment. Um, so we never want to eliminate, we never want to, to punish our dogs when we um, don't catch them in the act. And we certainly don't want to um, punish them when we do catch them in the act. Um, that's how we get that. That's when we get that ninja pooping kind of thing. Where, and then also we get them not wanting to pee outside for us either. Uh, but what you do want to do is eliminate, er, is um, interrupt them right away. So, you know, if, if I see my dog, if I've got a big marker happening and, um, you know, I know he's going to mark on this plant, um, you know, because I've, because I've seen it before and I'm kind of watching and I'm kind of planning on it. I will keep a leash on him um, and I might keep it hooked to my waist or I might let him drag it um, so that he thinks that I'm not paying attention, right? And then I'm going to keep my eyes on him and pretend like I'm not watching him until he goes over to, to lift his leg on that plant. Immediately when he does that, I'm going to interrupt him with a startling sound, something like, ah, ah, let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm going to grab the leash. We're going to run outside really, really quickly. And I'm going to stand there and he's probably going to stare at me and we're probably going to stare at each other for five minutes and then we're going to go back in. Eventually, after doing that enough, and I know this sounds labor intensive, but if you guys do this for two or three days, you'll have it nipped in the bud. Um, every single time you go out and he marks outside, it's praise, 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 treats, treats, treats. Um, every single time he goes to mark inside, it's ah, let's go, 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 let's go. outside, outside, outside. Um, if you do it, if you can catch it, um, if the timing is right, he's going to have the urge to pee. Um, and the, the protocol for marking and for house training is exactly the same. I know we think of it as a little bit different because what makes the urge it, um, is a little bit, it is different, um, but the protocol is exactly the same. We don't want to try to tell a dog that he can never mark, right? That has been handed down by his, in his DNA suite because he's a descendant of wolves, right? We're not going to be able to get any, any leverage with that. Um, what we want to say is, okay, when you mark outside, good things happen. When you mark inside, bad things happen, right? You get this, uh-uh, you get rushed outside. Um, you know, you have to pull, you have to hold your urine right in the middle of it, um, and it's a big to-do, and it's a whole thing. Um, and if you, if you do it enough, if you keep your management tight, um, so that, you know, the dog doesn't have the opportunity to sneak off and ninja mark when you're not paying attention, um, and, you know, you catch them in the act a couple times, and you catch them doing it outside, and they get lots and lots of praise and treats and stuff for doing it outside, um, that's kind of how you, that's how you do it. Um, and if you're having issues, you know, the, the, the biggest issues that we see are with little dogs, and I think it's mostly because they're just, they're able to sneak off a little bit better, and also when they do pee on the floor, it's not nearly as much as like a 60-pound dog, so I think it goes unnoticed a little bit more. Um, so if I ever have a small dog, that dog is always tethered to my waist for the first like four days, just because, um, you know, I kind of know that's how it's going to go. So, um, okay, let's see. For crate training, you guys, um, I just want to touch on this. So it really dovetails very, very nicely with house training um, if, you have the, if you have a dog crate trained. For normal times when we're all leaving and going to work, um, you know, you really want to have the dog somewhere in the house where she's not tempted to eliminate. Um, so when you do the crate training properly um, and, you, and you do all the protocol that in the handout that I sent you, tons and tons of treats in there, you know, you're very... Um, you're very uh, conservative about when you move forward to you know, 15 minutes in the crate or 30 minutes in the crate. And you always want to intermit big absences with short absences. Um, that is key. So if you, you know, if your dog's doing really well with 20 minutes here and there while you're running to the store and then you all of a sudden push it to six hours um, and your dog goes berserker for six hours and bends the wires to the crate and then gets out of the crate, 
guess what? The next time you're gone for six hours, that dog's gonna spend six hours trying to get out of the crate. Um, so be very, very careful that you don't have, um, that you don't, you know, just jump forward too quickly. And it's super tempting, especially with those of us that have normal jobs and we have to leave and stuff like that. Um, so I encourage you, if you are crate training and you need to be leaving for longer absences than your dog is ready, have the dog in a dog-proof room, a, a laundry room or a, base, or a basement or um, a bathroom or something like that with nothing in there that they can get into um, while you're gone for those long absences so that you don't blow the crate training. Um, slow and steady wins the race with crate training. Make sure that the dog is fully relaxing in there, is dozing and snoozing while you're watching your movie, dozing and snoozing while you're cooking dinner while she's in there. Um, you know, when you're walking in the room and out of the room and you're tossing treats in there and you're not tossing treats in there um, and you wanna kinda, you know, make sure that you move forward very incrementally. Um, now, that being said, uh, once you get your dog fully crate trained, um, which sometimes I can do it in a few days and sometimes it takes a few weeks, it just kind of depends on the dog, uh, but they really do not want to eliminate in their crate. So if you're still having house training issues um, and you just can't get everyone in the household on board with closing doors and you know all that kind of stuff, because that happens, um, you know, get the crate training down and then you can really make some good headway on the house training once you have that crate training down. Because every time your dog goes in the crate and she feels the need to eliminate, she's going to hold it. And that practice of holding it is what we need her to start doing. Um, and then that it dovetailed with the super, super lots of treat praise, fun time party every time she pees outside. Um, those things are going to go together and, and start teaching her that when she feels that urge to eliminate, it's in her best interest to hold it, even if she's in the house and not in the crate. Um, okay, let's see. Oh, one other thing I will say about marking. Um, so, you know, everybody's got the, like, you know, the enzyme spray stuff. You're supposed to get the, you know, the um, certain stuff in the cleaner to get rid of the scent of urine. Um, I think that's a total load. I don't think it does anything. Um, I have never had a cleaner that I have tried, and I have tried them all, that has actually resulted in my Aussie not going right over to that spot and sniffing it. Um, you know, so he, I, I, I think that, I, you know, Dogs' noses are so incredibly, incredibly good. Um, you know, I wouldn't waste a whole lot of time on that, and I certainly wouldn't think it's going to solve your house training problem. Um, what is going to solve your house training problem is tighten up that management, make sure they can't sneak off and go, and lots and lots of praise when they go outside. Um, if anybody has had major success with that, um, you know, with the enzyme -y stuff, let me know. I'd be curious about it. Um, okay, resource guarding. Um, so dog dog resource guiding guarding guide, well just resource guarding in general um it's 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 very very natural for dogs to do again it has been handed down in their dna from the fact that their ancestors they share ancestries with wolves um you know do, wolves who did not guard their their carcass their cash um they died they did not pass down their dna so by definition um the dogs who passed down dna the the wolves who passed down dna to our dogs were the ones who resource guarded the best right um so just because some dogs don't do it at all does not mean by any means that we should expect that no dog should do it it's actually a marvel to me that that more dogs don't resource guard based on how important it was for their ancestors um so what resource guarding is is you know it, uh, people call it food aggression or toy aggression or, you know, whatever. Um, what you guys, what it is, is basically, you know, a dog be, you know, showing some kind of, dis, of display of aggression around a resource. Food bowls, number one, most common, right? Um, toys can also be up there. Bones and stuff like that can really, really be up there. Um, However, I've seen some really quirky resource guarding stuff. I've seen, you know, dogs resource guard plants. Um, you know, <laughs> dogs will resource guard couch, you know, their favorite spot on the couch or their dog bed, um, you know, and dogs will resource guard you. Um, a lot of times, or I should say, it's not uncommon for a dog who's been sprung from the shelter 
um, and who has, has really, really found a person of value who has completely changed their entire universe around um, for that dog to start to kind of guard that person a little bit, especially around other dogs. So um, what that'll look like is, you know, stiffening, um, a hard stare, you know, you guys have seen those big old pupil eyes where the dog just kind of stops and stares and all the hair on your neck goes up, you know, something's about to happen. Um, or a little snarl, a little like showing the, uh, the canine there. Um, it can be a snap, it can be a growl, it can be a rah, 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 that real quick burst of um, two or three barks in a row. Um, it could even be a lunge and bark, um, and then it could be a snap, it, it could be a bite, um, and it could, of course, escalate into an all out dog fight. So, um, everything that I just mentioned, aside from those last two, are kind of par for the course, and the, um, the, knowledge that we have, the up-to-date knowledge in the dog training world kind of says to let that go, right? Let the dogs work it out. Um, you know, if I'm eating a cheeseburger and you were to come over and take it out of my hands, I might have some unkind words from you for you. Um, if you did it again and you did it again and you did it again and you did it again, I might escalate, um, you know, who knows, especially if I was really, really hungry or if I had been really hungry in the past. Uh, so we want to make sure that um, we give dogs the opportunity to, to, to communicate, right? Resource guarding is communicating between them. And if we continuously get involved and we, you know, we try to make sure that no dog ever growls at another dog over a bone, um, it can kind of complicate the communication between the dogs and it actually makes the whole thing take longer to work out. Um, if I was trying to have an argument with my friend and we needed to figure something out and we had to get to the bottom of it and every single time we went to have this argument, I got interrupt we got interrupted, um, it would just prolong us actually getting to it, right? So um, you wanna make sure that you let the dogs work it out as long as they are not hurting one another. Um, so, you know, a little puncture here and there, um, especially on the ears and on the, the face. So a lot of times we'll see just in like a regular old doggy argument, um, you know, a, a, a lot of blood coming from like an ear or a nick on the face or something like that. And it's very, very scary. However, um, I want you guys to try and keep in mind with stuff like that. If those, if those dogs wanted to really injure one another, they would have. The amount of mouth control that it takes for a dog um, to just nick another dog in the face is pretty is, it's pretty crazy. Um, so they are exercising a lot of control. They are very aware that they're just in an argument and they are not trying to hurt each other. And they're trying to get, you know, control of the bone or the, you know, piece of kibble that got under the couch or God knows what they see as a resource. Um, so for dog dog stuff that is not injurious, um, we like to let it go. If you um, have a visceral reaction to that and it's really hard for you, um, no, don't feel bad because we have evolved with pointy teethed animals and we are, our physio physiological disposition is to, um, you know, have our blood pressure spike up and to become really nervous when we do hear those rah, 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 um, those scraps kind of thing. So if you are adverse to that, I definitely recommend that you get your management on point. So no resources ever around the dogs when they are together. Um, you know, no feeding time together, have uh, multiple water bowls around the house. Um, if you're sitting on the couch and one of the dogs guards you, it's a no-no, you get up and walk away. Um, and you wanna make sure that each of the dogs has access to the resource for the same amount of time. Um, so if you are the resource and you've got a couple of resource guarders in the house that are snarking at each other and it's making you nervous, then um, divide your evening, right? You've got one hour on the couch with um, Fido and then um, during that time, you know, Spot is in the office and his getting his crate training time done. He's got his butcher bone in there or his stuffed Kong or whatever and then you swap them out. Um, so that they don't have the opportunity to fight over the spot next to you on the couch. Or you just take it away from both of them altogether. Um, no one has access to that spot on the couch. And you can do that again with management. Crates, baby gates, uh, X-pens are amazing for resource guarding, multi-dog resource guarding households. Um, so for uh, resource guarding with humans, again, same thing. Um, it's a little bit crazy to think that any dog at any time should allow us to just stick our hand in their food bowl and take their food away. Um, especially dogs who have had, um, who have, have struggled to get food in the past. So it's, it's pretty, when you think about it, it's pretty um, incredible that more don't actually snap at us and, and growl and try to, try to guard their food. Um, so for mild resource guarding, you know, just stiffening, um, you know, 
whatever, growling and stuff like that. If you have a foster dog through your home and you know they're only going to be there for a couple of weeks, you could definitely just manage it. Um, so what that would mean is, again, the dog gets fed in the bathroom behind the closed door. Um, you never, ever reach for his food bowl. If you ever have to take anything away from him, you always have something of higher value that will trump it. Um, and what that looks like is a bait and switch. So you'll take a hunk a hot dog that looks like this and you'll wave it in front of his nose and once he sees it you'll toss it and as soon as he goes for that hot dog you'll grab the bully stick or you'll grab the bone or something like that um, there is a resource guarding protocol that works really well um, you know if you if you are so inclined to train um, resource guarding is the is the one um, the one form of aggression that is the easiest to modify and to train out of dogs. And that resource guarding protocol that I gave you guys in that handout is how you do it. It's a whole lot of approaching the food bowl, tossing in a bonus, walking away. Approach the food bowl, toss in a bonus, walk away. And eventually you baby step that up to approach the food bowl, pick up the food bowl, put in the bonus, set it back down. Um, and what you're doing with that protocol is you're changing the dog's uh, mind from, um, oh God, here she comes, she's gonna take away my food, she's gonna take away my food, I better growl, to, oh God, here she comes, she's gonna give me a hot dog, I better wag my tail and look so super cute. Um, so what you're doing there is you're just, um, you're changing the dog's uh, behavior through changing, by changing their emotional response. So when a dog is, is, is experiencing the need to resource guard, they are experiencing fear, anxiety, um, and that fear and anxiety is that their stuff's going to get taken away. I don't know if you guys have ever thought for a second that you, that someone stole your purse <laughs> or something like that, that spike of fear that your resources are getting taken from you, it's real. Um, and that's what, that's what contributes to that resource guarding behavior. So what we do is we teach the dog that actually, no, every time a human approaches your food, um, not only do I not take your food away, but good things happen. You get a piece of high fat content food, um, for allowing me to come up to you and grab your food. And, and those protocols go way, way, way past it to, to the point where you can grab a bone out of a dog's mouth and all that kind of stuff. And if you guys are so inclined and if Fosco lets you, I'll train you how to do that. But um, just for, purpose, for fostering purposes, the old bait and switch is the best way to handle um, a resource guard or toss something of major higher value. And then you can kind of sneak away the item that they've been guarding, so. Okay, um, let's open it up for questions. Oh my God, I'm impressed. You did it all in, in 40 minutes. I'm pretty I'm good. very type A. <laughs> <laughs> so I will unmute everybody okay. and open it up for the questions, but we already have a question that came through the chat. That's Morgan, Morgan was asking us, um, unmute all, oh, hold on, I'm checking. Okay, so I think this, I'm not sure if everybody's on mute. Anyway, first question for Morgan. Um, uh, and everybody, just to make sure that, so we're going to go through the Q&A, finish the meeting. After the meeting, I'll send you a survey because I want feedback on this. And on this, I'm yes. sure Marie does I would too. also like feedback, yes. Yeah, so I'll send the survey via email. Uh, there's only three questions, just a little bit of your time. I would appreciate it. Anyway, first question from Morgan. She said, how do you pre prevent scratching on the door when you're uh, trying to te potty train a puppy or a dog? Um, Morgan, do you mean scratching on the door to be let out? Let's see. Sorry, I was still on mute. I actually mean um, like scratching on the door for crate training. So we left our, dog, our foster dog alone for like 20 minutes or even maybe even less to go to the store and she kind of scratched up the back of the door um, yep. and that was before we had a crate. So now we are trying to crate train, but just want to know if we can leave her alone again without her scratching on the door without barking yeah. or anything like that. Gotcha. So no, um, if you, if you are not up to the 20 minute mark yet, um, and it sounds like what you're dealing with is, is a little bit more of separation anxiety and I would be happy to do a whole hour or more on separation anxiety for you guys. Um, because it's a bear, it's workable, but it is a bear. Um, you know, so if you know you have to leave your dog for longer than they are ready, like longer than they're ready to be in the crate, or you know, longer than like you can't just talk, take her in the car with you for those 20 minutes, you have to dog proof the room. And what that means is like, you know, I've taken cardboard before and like ace bandage wrapped cardboard around the bottom of a door of a house that was not mine, um, so that my so that my dog could scratch the door for 20 minutes while I was running to the store. Um, you know, there's really nothing that you can do to ensure while you are gone. 
um, that your dog is not going to be destructive other than the very, very incremental step-by-step -step protocol with the camera on the dog. Um, so you can see, okay, she did fine for five minutes. Um, let's go ahead and, and push it to seven. Let's, oh, she did okay for seven. Let's go ahead and push it to 10. But again, you're getting into separation anxiety uh, protocol there. Um, that's a little bit beyond what we, what we are talking about today with, with just crate training, house training. Um, so I strongly suggest you to figure out some Do kind of dog. Any... Go ahead. I was going to say, do you have any resources for separation anxiety? I know you sent stuff over for like crate yep. training and everything. Sure That'd do. Be great. Thank you. Because I definitely think uh, that's what it is because she's so well behaved and she's very well body trained and everything on that side of things. But I definitely think it's a separation anxiety thing. Yeah, this is a really good time to get a, an amazing foundation on the Sepanx protocol um, because it does require, you know, several days of not leaving unless until you're unless you're planning it out. You know, um, yeah, so totally. the first thing that you'll really need is a camera and you can get, um, you can get a pretty good cheap camera from Yi. Actually, I'll show you. These are mine here. Um, uh, Yi, it's YI home camera. This one's like 35 bucks and it's amazing. It, it hooks into an app on your phone and you can hit record. Um, and, you know, it's, it's very mobile. You can kind of, you know, uh, stick it anywhere. Um, and it, it really helps with getting some separation anxiety foundation up and going. Next question. It is from Shannon. Um, she would like to know what you do with dogs the first night you have them. I sleep on the floor with them. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Um, most of the time because for me, you know, I'm either doing a board and train or um, I really want to get that crate training down. Um, so a lot of times, you know, if, if, if I have a dog who is not going to be compatible with my dogs or something like that, and I'm really, really trying to get the crate training going, I will put the dog to bed in the crate, um, to sleep in the crate. Um, and what that will mean is I'll make sure that the whole day we've spent playing the game, the in and out game and the close the door game and the, you know, alone and okay game where I, I'm walking out of the, I'm walking out of the space for 10 seconds. I'm walking out of the space for 30 seconds and I'm coming back. Um, and then I will, I'll make myself a little bed up on the floor um, next to the crate and I will lay down and have my computer and start watching something. And every few seconds, um, I'll pop in a little treat or a piece of cream cheese and I will put more and more time in between those until the dog starts to fall asleep. And then I will very, very slowly um, creep out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually do that for the first two or so nights just because I need my dogs to sleep in the crate at my house because of the setup that I have here. Um, it's much, much more beneficial if they do. However, if I'm being lazy daisy and I just have a dog for a few days and it's no big deal, um, I just have the dog sleep in bed with me because I love to snuggle. So I think it's really up to you and it's maybe up to how much you need that crate training on board. Um, if you've got a dog who's adult, who's house trained, who's not chewing up stuff, who's you know totally fine with your other dogs, um, you know, have them sleep in the bed with you or have them sleep on their dog bed right next to your bed. Um, and if they try to hop up in the bed and you don't want that, every single time they get up in the bed, you got to get out, pat down on the bed where, the, where you want them to be, get them down there, give them a little loving, and then curl back into bed. They jump back up. It's the same thing. Um, I always plan on not getting much sleep the first night of a new foster. Always. Just do it so that you're not mad about it. Um, and, you know, have a plan for where you want them to sleep before you even start the nighttime routine so that you can kind of start orienting, orienting them towards that spot um, when everybody's winding down and, and you're having your glass of wine and stuff like that. Good question. Thank you. Next question is from Alba. How do you get dogs to not jump on you or others and that walk into your home? I will send you the jumping protocol. Jumping protocol. So jumping um, is one of those things that's very, very tough to train out. Um, not because the, the protocol is difficult to understand or is, you know, hairy or anything because it's tedious and it takes a lot of patience from us. So dogs learn from a very early age that jumping is a good thing. Um, whoever had them as puppies, whether it was the breeder or, you know, the rescue mom or whatever, the foster mom, I guarantee you that um, as soon as those puppies were big enough, everybody started scooping those puppies up and bringing them right to their face. So um, puppies 
learn really from a young age that being close to the face is a good thing. They get lots of praise, they get lots of kisses, it's a whole thing. And then also dogs, um, they get information from orifice sniffing. So when you've come home from a long day, um, there is a lot of information that a dog can glean from sniffing your mouth and your nose. Um, and, and also dogs greet one another. Um, there's a, it's a pro-social behavior. They greet one another by licking mouths. So all kinds of reason for the dog to jump up on you when you get home. Um, and then um, we end up encouraging this behavior by doing what we think is the right thing by saying, no, bad, off, bad dog, get down, no, no. Um, and the dog is hearing wah, 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 and thinking, yes, this is working. Not only am I getting to sniff and lick her face, but she's inter interacting with me, she's engaging with me, she's playing this push game. Um, it's all fun and games. So every problem behavior that we have, you guys, there's two two pillars to solving every problem behavior. The first pillar is that the behavior has to stop working for the dog. So that means that every time the dog jumps up, he has to stop getting access to your face and stop getting your attention. Um, so what that looks like is every time the dog jumps on you, you turn your back on the dog. Um, for really strong jumpers and really big dogs, Every time the dog jumps on you, I will walk out of the room and close the door for 90 seconds. And it better be a door that the dog can scratch up because they're probably gonna come after you and throw a fit. Um, the longer that a, a problem behavior has been going on, the longer it takes the protocol to work to nip it in the bud. So if your dog's been jumping for six years and it's been working for him to get attention, be prepared for a long haul um, to, to train him to stop jumping. But if you, um, the, the first pillar, if that jumping quits working for him, and then the second pillar is we always have to teach our dogs what to do instead to gain that same reinforcement. So several times throughout the day, and you'll see this in the protocol that I send, ask the dog to sit. Once the dog is sitting, give him lots of love and put your face down by his face and maybe let him give you a couple kisses. And we teach the dog that sitting is what works for attention. And so the protocol kind of, it works its way along and then it dovetails into this. You walk in the door, you ask the dog to sit. If the dog sits, you get down and give him lots of love. Um, if the dog gets up and jumps, you turn around and walk out of the door. Um, and, the, and the problem with the jumping protocol is that everyone has to be on board with it. Um, so if you've got kids, if you've got grandmas, if you've got neighbors that are coming into the house that just cannot um, ignore a dog when he jumps on them, um, then your best bet is, is management. So that just looks like, you know, every time you come home from work, the dog is in, a, in another space, in a baby gate or a next pen space until he calms down enough for you to interact with him. And I might take a handful of hot dog hunks when I walk in the door and scatter them so that instead of orienting towards me and wanting to jump on me, he's eating, he's getting that high fat content food, he's getting that dopamine and serotonin, um, and those chemicals are gonna start calming him down so that by the time I open the X pen, maybe he's not so excited to jump on me and he's not gonna screw it up. Good question. I can send that jumping protocol out to everyone too. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you. You bet. Next question is from uh, Nicole. What if my dog only pees in the house when we have left the home and the dog has gone while outside prior to us leaving? Crate, crate, crate. Mm. Get that dog in a crate and feed it in every single corner of the crate. I would smear cream cheese in every single little two inches of that crate. Um, dogs don't want to defecate or urinate where they eat. Um, so if that, I, I, would, I would really, really hammer in the crate training. That's gonna be your most, most valuable thing. Um, so then when you're gone, um, you know, they, you know, she's gonna be like, oh man, I really have to pee. Oh, can't pee there. Gosh, can't be there. Can't be there. Can't be there. I guess I better hold it right? And then you come home, you open the door, you guys go right outside, the dog pees, and you throw a dang party like this dog has never seen. Like She just thinks that the universe just opened up and rained chicken on her. Like, skip dinner. Have dinner be a whole chicken breast for the first time. <laughs> she holds her pee and then actually does it outside. Seriously, it's, you can get a lot of bang for your buck by blowing the dog's mind the first time that they urinate outside um, when they've had to hold it. When they, they get that experience of muscle tightness and of, of hanging on to the to the urine or the you know whatever, and then um, you know when they when they get that relief, they get a bunch of stuff. They get the the actual relief that it feels for getting for getting to eliminate, and then they get this amazing party from you. So is that is that the same when it seems like it's kind of like that revenge pee of us? <laughs> wow, well, revenge pee. <laughs> yeah. So what revenge pee is? Um, is what we talked about earlier. So you guys are getting foster dogs in your home. So you have no idea what um, the history has been like for these guys. It's very, very likely that someone punished your dog for peeing um, in the house. 
And so what happens is that they learn to hold it while you're around, and then when you're gone, they feel like it's safe to eliminate. Never mind the fact that you've never punished them for peeing in the house. You are a human, and a, the, the pattern recognition of the dog's brain is going, okay, when I pee in the house in front of a human, I get my nose rubbed in it, so I better hold on to it until they're gone. Um, and most of the time those dogs have never actually properly been house trained, so they've never had any positive reinforcement for going outside. Um, so they actually think that inside is the place to go, and they actually think that inside away from you when you are gone is the best time to go because they know for a fact they're not going to get, um, you know, they're not going to get wrestled to the ground and, and manhandled and molested if they do it. Our next question is from Samantha. I, I'm sorry, I, I, I missed it. So how do I prevent a dog from jumping a six foot fence? Long line. Uh. So I did a long line. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. I did a long line, but because it gives traction, like I tied it around like a cement table because mm -hmm. um, it's a big dog. How, um, big are, how big are we talking? Like a hundred pounds. Oh gosh. Ooh. Um, she, it, it gives her traction to get out of her harness. Ah, yes. So, um, first of all, you want to make like sure. She's like trying to escape, but yeah. it's like, a, it's dangerous and it's very she dangerous. loves to be outside. So if I had, if I had that dog in my home, she would never be allowed outside without me, um, without me holding the end of a leash. And if I ever saw that she was like, you know, pacing or anything towards the fence, I would redirect her onto me and toss a handful of hot dogs towards the house. Um, and continuously, I would really, really hammer and recall for her um, so that she has a bomb proof recall. So every time she hears her name, she whips around and comes flying towards you so that you can kind of stop that, um, that in its tracks when she goes to go to the gate. I would also have my 50 foot line on her. I wouldn't necessarily tie it onto anything. I might having her have her drag it so that if I am trying to do something like, you know, read a book or something like that and she goes taking off towards the fence, boom, I can grab that line before she goes to get over it. The other thing you might consider is coyote rollers, depending on if this is your own dog or if this is a foster dog. They're amazing. It's a foster. Um, they're, they're awesome for that kind of thing. Um, What's that? I would make sure a coyote, coyote roller. Yeah. Um, it's just a rig on the top of the fence. That's like a, if you could picture like the, 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 the DIY ones are like PVC pipe on a pole. Okay. Um, so if the oh. dog tries to get on there, it spins. Um, they try oh, to get okay. to the top of it, it spins. So they can't get over it. Um, but you know, I would really try, I would try to work at the underlying reason why your dog is trying to escape in the first place and hammer in the enrichment and the exercise and the food puzzles and the training and the, you know, every time that dog ate, I would, I would scatter her kibble all around the entire yard so that she spent an hour and a half searching out her kibble and that would tire her out. I would also try to take her on an hour long, long line sniffy walk so that she could get plenty of sniffing, plenty of enrichment that way. And then, you know, she'd have a, a bloody, a frozen bloody butcher bone every night for dinner instead of any, instead of kibble or whatever. Um, and I can send you the enrichment and the mental stimulation stuff. Okay. Um, she seems very smart. So. Oh yeah. That would be helpful. That's the, that's the problem with those escape artists is that they've normally had a history of having it su su succeed. Um, and there's no amount of enrichment that you can pull out of your ass that can compete with a doggy adventure off leash. So <laughs> yeah. And it, so she's, she's like, like um, gotten out and she's taking herself on little doggy adventures. You have your work cut out for you. It's going to be a ton and of she like lays down. Like if I go for a walk, if I don't go to the right place, she'll lay down and I can't move her. Oh boy. She's very stubborn. So then it's just, it's, she's so heavy. It's, it's, yeah. it's been very challenging. I wouldn't leave the house unless I had like a couple of hours to wait that dog out. Um, oh, it's, but it's, oh, again, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm coming from a trainer angle from a foster home angle. If you just kind of want to deal with it, um, I would just be very cognizant of, you know, maybe not really going too far on your walks and maybe having yeah. somebody with a car who can come and get you if that's the case. Um, yeah. But you know, try not to try not to give in and let that behavior work for her. As unfortunate as it is, you know, then the more so what the would more be giving in, her. like going that direction, or totally, yeah, okay. Because I I don't I just bring food, but I don't know perfect. if I'm rewarding her, but to get her back into the house. Yeah, perfect. You can okay. feed her anytime she walks with you and walks along next to you, even if it's where she thinks she wants to go. Feed her consistently the whole time. 
So okay. start her getting used to every time I take a few steps and I don't lay down, I get a piece of chicken and cut the dang kibble out for a couple days. Give her just chicken and have her earn it by walking next to you on your walk and just continuing pace for pace and go around the whole block and give her a whole chicken breast for dinner. Um, and, you know, so she starts to learn, okay, if I keep walking, I get this, I get this reinforcement of both things. First of all, the walk continues and I get to sniff and access the world. And then second of all, I get this chicken and she will really want that chicken because she'll be hungry because you'll be withholding it in any other circumstance. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah, you bet. Our next question is from Megan. So what do you do when you discover your dog has leash reactions on a walk, barking or lunging towards another dog yes. or people? I have a whole um, handout on unleash reactivity. Um, the easiest and best, um, you know, protocol that we have for reactivity is um, go the other way, right? Especially for a foster dog, a dog that you don't know how long you're going to have her, um, you know, get as much space as you can every single time you see another dog, um, give a really, really wide berth. And then in addition to that, if you want to train, we'll, uh, we train the dog to sit and stay and to hold a sit stay while any stimulus goes past. Um, and you want to start that practice without anything around. You even want to start it like in your living room or in your backyard, put the dog on leash, walk for about 10 feet and then cue the dog to sit. Um, while she sits and she's holding her sit, you're gonna continuously feed her like a Pez dispenser for holding her butt on the ground. And she's gonna be like, oh, this is super easy. I totally got this. All I have to do is hold my butt on the ground. And then you're gonna slowly increase the difficulty of the stimulus that's going past her. So you're gonna start by going in the backyard and then maybe when there's a squirrel, cue her to sit. Feed her continuously while the squirrel is squirreling around um, and then release her and keep going on your walk. Um, and then start practicing out in front of the house and just kind of hang out in front yard, waiting for people to walk by. And right now they're all walking by. Um, and, and <laughs> as soon as she sees somebody way off, cue her to sit. And if it's going to be a really, really hard one, like a, a you know, a barky chewini or something on the end of a leash, like pinging around, um, feed her really quickly, feed her lots really fast. I will grab a whole scoop of cream cheese in my hand and shove it in my dog's mouth. Um, shove it in her snout. If I'm like not as far as I need to be in training and I've got a, you know, a, a gaggle of geese is walking past the road and I'm like, dang it, sit, cream cheese, whole, whole bunch of cream cheese right in the snout. Um, and you can incrementally make it more difficult by getting closer to the the other dog that's walking past. Um, and if you, if you don't have any treats on you that day, or, you know, you're just mentally out to lunch and you just don't feel like freaking training, um, go the other way, get as much distance as you need to for your dog to be successful. Um, for really, really bad reactivity, I have had to go like half a football length away to get the dog to sit. And I start there and I incrementally go every five feet closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. But that's if you want to train. If you're just trying to handle a foster dog, I would recommend a, a lot of management. Just go the other way. Um, and every time you see another dog get really excited and happy, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. As you turn the other way, when the dog does their U-turn and comes towards you, they get a few treats right popped right in the snout. So every time they see another dog, they think, ooh, are we going to play that fun game where we turn around and run the other way and I get a piece of chicken? Instead of seeing another dog and thinking, oh, go away. <laughs> One more sense? question. Yeah. Okay. One more question from Bonnie. So she's had a few fosters that were so stressed and nervous uh, during the first few days that they won't even take any super high value treats. Yep. So how do you get them to go outside at all if they're too scared and even if, even if you can't lure them out with food? Yeah. Um, so you've got a little bit of a, um, you've got a little bit of a, a kind of a moral dilemma there. Um, you know, if I have a dog who is afraid of me, well, first of all, just as a general rule, I, um, I don't ever have a dog in my house for the first couple days that I don't know that I don't leave a leash on. Um, so right now I've got my new little foster dog here, Jedi. Um, I had never met him. Um, so he has a, he has a drag line on him. And what I did with this, um, hold on for one second. So what I like to do for um, getting caught under furniture and getting caught under the refrigerator when the dog's walking around and stuff like that. Um, I'll take the slip and I'll put this, I'll just put the slip lead around the dog's, you know, the hook on his collar 
and then I will cut this part of it off so that the whole thing is very flat um, and light and it's easy for the dog to drag around. He doesn't feel like he's dragging a leash. There's nothing clattering behind him and scaring him and it's not hooking under anything getting him stuck. And then that way, if I have a dog who clearly doesn't really want me to approach her or want me to touch her in any way, um, I can just kind of very gingerly always just kind of pick up the end of the leash and say, come on, let's go, baby, let's go. Um, and if I have a dog who's really scared, I might do twice this. I have a little, I have a rope. It's a straight up rope. Um, and I will tie the rope onto the dog's collar and, ha and, and you know, have 10 feet of rope so that I can pick it up 10 feet away from her if that's what she needs. Um, and just kind of let's go, come on, and coax her very slowly outside. If you put a little pressure on the neck, most of the time they will begrudgingly come. Now, if this whole protocol makes your dog completely terrified and panic and shrink, um, then what I would do is I would set up some potty pads in my office and allow the dog to just go in the office for a couple of days. Um, and that's just a choice that I make based on behavior. At that point, it's more important for me to get a good trust bond going with this dog um, than it is for her not to pee in my office, which is where a million dogs have peed anyway. So, um, so that's kind of what I would do. Or I put her maybe in a bathroom, or maybe in a, you know a basement or a laundry room or somewhere where you know it's not gonna it's it's not gonna drive you nuts that um, that that happens. But hopefully, that will be a very rare situation, unless unless you like the scaredy cats, in which case um, you know some of the puppy mill dogs kind of display like that, and you know some of the dogs who've been really badly abused um, and a lot of times elimination comes with that right so those same dogs have been yelled at for eliminating so they hold it for like days and they don't want to go in front of you and they don't want to go outside and um, they're real heartbreakers but um, you know patience time and space um, are the two things that you know usually make those dogs come around and eventually they will be hungry enough to take your high fat content food and it works the same way on their brains as it does everybody else's so eventually you will be able to get some dopamine and serotonin going in their brains um, because they'll be hungry enough to eat and they don't have to eat it with you standing there um, if you toss in the chicken and then you leave and you come back and they've eaten it um, you're making progress That's Good question. So I, I don't have any more questions on the chat. I wonder if anybody else has any, any questions. And I've noticed that most participants are still muted because they muted themselves. I can't unmute them. But um, if people have more questions, please unmute yourself and, and, and ask it. Well, Sounds like we have no more questions. I'm amazed by everybody. You've been wonderful participants. Yay, um, thank you guys so much. Oh, sorry, Marie, I interrupted you. No, <laughs> I'm just saying that I probably work with a bunch of chimpanzees because meetings don't go this way at all. Participants have been so well behaved here, I'm amazed. <laughs> Yeah, this has been wonderful. Um, thank you guys so much for the opportunity. I've been going crazy with just not enough to do. So um, this has been really great and I would be happy to do another one. Um, I will send the entire group, actually I'll send it to, to you, Marie, and then if you wanna um, get it out, I'll do um, some separation anxiety stuff, some jumping stuff, some on-leash reactivity stuff, and then some general um, enrichment and mental stimulation. Um, anything else? No, I think that's it. Okay. So, so everybody should expect two emails from me. One is the survey itself. Um, I'll be looking for feedback from everybody. And then the second one is going to be the addi additional um, hand handouts. Awesome. Okay. Molly, can I ask a quick question? Sure, of course. Do you have any uh, protocols on humping? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, I, I would just do a, a strict punishment, a straight timeout as punishment protocol for that. Um, so the best, the best way to get a humper to stop humping is to match them up with a dog who will give them an appropriate correction. Um, what if they do it to people? Oh, gosh. Uh, punishment. Absolutely. Walk out of the room, close the door every single time. No, no ifs, ands, or buts. And I would keep a leash on that dog um, so that if they were big and heavy and they, and they were like a latcher, um, I would have a second person okay. who could grab the leash and pull them off and haul them into a timeout. And they would sit in a dark bathroom and think about what they did um, for several <laughs> minutes. And I would do that every single time they go to hump. I can okay. send you the timeout as punishment protocol. Oh, yeah, that's great. You guys can use timeouts um, to punish any unwanted behavior other than um, elimination doesn't work for that. 
So okay. I'll just send you the timeout as punishment stuff too. And um, it kind of, it, it tells you how to go through it. So you want to have a, um, you want to have a cue. You want to have a word that communicates to the dog that he's just about to blow it. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a separate cue that tells him that the timeout is coming. And these two together um, eventually give the chance, give the dog the chance to correct his behavior when he hears the first one. So I normally okay. do like a, um, that's enough. And then if the dog ceases, oh, what a good boy, such a good boy, lots of treats, lots of praise. Um, if the dog continues to hump, then it's too bad, and I march him right into the timeout. Um, okay. So then what happens is the dog starts to think when he hears that's enough, um, oh gosh, could I keep this timeout from happening somehow? How could I keep this timeout from happening? What if I stop humping? Um, right? right, so then you have this, now you have this nice cue called that's enough, um, which every time you see that posture, you can throw it out. Um, and if you've, if you've done your punishment timeout schedule enough, which is one to one ratio, every single freaking time he does it, he gets timed out. Um, you know, then you can use that. That's enough is, is in every day, whenever you have the dog park, that kind of stuff too. Okay. That's helpful. That makes sense. Thank Humping you. humans. Yeah. That's one I haven't gotten in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I encountered it with a, with a puppy. And really? So, yeah, so it's, it's cute now, but um, when he, he's like, I don't know, maybe 20 pounds, it's like four months old. Oh, no. Yeah. No. He thinks you're another puppy. He thinks you're a puppy. <laughs> Probably, yeah. Yeah. 